many people just need to lose weight, you know, especially here in the U S and we're starting to see it cascade out to some other countries. Um, but weight loss probably doesn't really ensure health per se, but I do believe that there are studies that show when people lose, I believe it's like 10% of their body weight that they get some, uh, really extra great benefits in terms of their like long-term health. Um, but again, we wouldn't really know what's going on on the inside. We wouldn't know what's going on with your heart and your cardiovascular uh, unless we were getting blood work done. You need to get uh, blood work done routinely. Uh, big, big uh, advocate of that. The, 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 the weight loss kind of conversation is super interesting. Because you can improve your health by losing weight on a number of different diets. And there's a bunch of research looking at that. You know, Roy Taylor in the UK, who's probably the, the kind of one of the leading researchers looking at type 2 diabetes and poor metabolic health. And he has some seminal studies looking uh, at how does weight loss affect metabolic health. Mm -hmm. um, one's called the DIRECT trial. And this is where that 10 to 15% of body weight uh, figure really comes from. His, his research, if you take people with type 2 diabetes, so they have very poor metabolic health, they have a lot of fat being stored in their organs, ectopic fat, um, and you get them to lose about 10 to 15% of their body weight, providing they haven't had type 2 diabetes for too long, such that their pancreas is completely burned out, if they still have some function in their beta cells in the, in the pancreas, if they lose 10% of their body weight, a large percentage of them can go into remission. Hmm. So they can they can get the fat out of the liver and the pancreas and also the muscle tissue. Which might be heart protective as well. Yeah, there'll be huge cardiovascular benefits here. Hmm. Um, because when you have excessive fat building up in the, the liver, you start to get increased fats um, being transported through circulation. Hmm. It has to go somewhere. And how do we do that? We increase VLDL production in the liver, which is an hmm. ApoB containing lipoprotein. So this is why one of the main reasons why people with diabetes, they don't die of diabetes, they die of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. when, when these people lose 10 to 15% of their overall body weight, they're able to lower their fat in those organs to what he describes as below their personal fat threshold. And this is a really important concept for people to understand. It's it's super interesting. I think it's fascinating that some people can be very fat and still be right. very healthy. Right. So <laughs> so how does that make sense? You can have two people in front of you and one lucky bugger, as we'd say in Australia. <laughs> yeah. He he has he has escaped insulin resistance and type two diabetes. And the next person has significant elevations in blood glucose, uncontrolled diabetes, mm -hmm. ends up requiring all sorts of medications. So his research was able to elucidate what this is. And it comes back to personal fat threshold, which speaks to the capability of your subcutaneous fat stores to accept fat. Subcutaneous fat, complex name, just means the fat underneath your skin. So we have like three main fat depots, subcutaneous fat, under the skin, visceral fat, which is between organs, mm. and ectopic fat inside, intra. Some people have a greater capacity, it's genetic, to store fat subcutaneously. These people at a given body weight are protected from metabolic disease mm -hmm. because it's the fat that gets inside the organs that is really damaging. That's what drives insulin resistance. And whereas the next person at the same level of body fatness has less subcutaneous fat, it starts to spill over mm. and it spills over and starts getting stored. Initially, it actually shows up in skeletal muscle. Then it's in the liver, which is really the master regulator of metabolic health. And then after the, the liver, it ends up spilling back into circulation and winding up in the pancreas and it starts to cause those beta cells to become dysfunctional. Eventually, that person ends up with an elevated HbA1c above 6.5% and they get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, coming back to your original point, these metabolic conditions are conditions of energy toxicity. Mm. It's energy toxicity beyond your personal fat threshold. And so the only way to get those into remission is to lose weight that gets you below your personal fat threshold. And people often wonder, well, how do I work out my personal fat threshold? Don't work it out. <laughs> <laughs> just, do, just do blood work. So if you're doing your blood work and 
your uh, fasting glucose is elevated, HbA1c is elevated, um, your triglycerides are elevated. These are all signs of poor metabolic health. Mm -hmm. And you have an increased waist circumference, which is better than BMI for um, getting a sort of window into the fat that you're depositing around the organs. If, if you're getting that feedback from your blood work and you're overweight, you're probably above your personal fat threshold. So find a way to lose weight and we could discuss what are the different options uh, if you want. But find a way to, to drop that 10% of body weight and when those things that you're measuring through your blood work start to normalize, then that's a sign that you're starting to get that fat out of those organs um, and then your metabolic health is better and you see that through improved blood glucose control, for example. What about muscle mass? Uh, muscle mass must help a little bit because it helps chew up some energy. Yes, it, it and and it also helps you better utilize glucose. Mm. Um, so the more m muscle mass you have, the the higher your um, glycogen storage is. So you have it's like a muscle is like a sponge. Mm. So when we when we eat um, food, if we have more muscle mass, we have a greater way to kind of dispose of that glucose and and. Because glucose is balanced, it's 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 a homeostatic system. It's like extra storage uh, area that's not one of our organs, right? So you can think about. I often use a bathtub analogy here. So if you think about a a bathtub, you're running the water. Okay, the tap is the liver, and what's coming out of the tap, the water. Let's just imagine that that's glucose. So one of the primary roles of the liver is to produce glucose and pump it into the blood because mm -hmm. often we're fasting overnight. We don't want our blood glucose to drop too low. Uh, so the liver's on, glucose is going into the bath. Let's imagine the bath is circulation and there's a drain at the bottom. That drain is your skeletal muscle. So we run into problems when either we can't turn off the tap, so you're insulin resistant at the liver, which happens when that fat builds up in the liver. So now the liver is just pumping glucose out, can't turn it off. That's the role of insulin at the liver is to turn the glucose production off. Or if we have insulin resistance at the, at the muscle, that drain is blocked. Worst case, you have both. So you have drain blocked, taps on, mm. bathtubs filling up and up and up, oh, up and up and up. Um, so as we improve our lean mass and have – have more skeletal muscle, we're sort of opening up that drain. We have a, a greater capacity to clear mm. excess glucose. Um, and certainly another kind of quote unquote hack, I'm not a huge fan of that term, but um, it comes up a lot in discussions about glucose is if you have poor blood glucose control, one of the best things you can do after you eat is move your body because you will get immediate increase in insulin sensitivity. Yeah. You'll get upregulation of different transport of proteins that help pulling glucose out of the blood and get it into the muscle and it can be metabolized or stored.